So in my last few videos on sound output from the 6502 based homebrew computer, we built this simple tone generator. We have a 1.8 megahertz crystal oscillator circuit. We have two 8-bit programmable down counters to divide that frequency down into the audible range. We have a D flip-flop to square out the waveform and to even up the duty cycle. And just a few resistors to make it suitable to pass into some amplified speakers I've got over here. If I turn it on, you'll hear a tone. And we can use the right hand down counter. We can re reconfiguring the value on the right hand down counter will change the pitch of the tone within an octave. And obviously we can pick lots of other values than the ones I've chosen there. And the left hand down counter is configured to do octave division. So changing this one changes the output octave. So if I remove some bits here, it will go up one octave at a time. So that's all well and good. What I'm going to talk about in this video is how we can connect this up to the 6502 so that the 6502 can drive these frequencies rather than having to change them by hand. Now an important attribute of this circuit, which is going to make it easy to hook up to the 6502, is that those frequencies are determined simply by the binary values on these pins of the two down counters. So all we need to do is send these 16 bits of information from the 6502 have it stored by this circuit in a format that these down counters can use. So here once again is my 6502 based homebrew computer. Uh, this is the 6522 and this is what we're going to be hooking the tone generator up to. So initially the easiest way to get these signals to the tone generator is simply to wire it directly into the pins of the 6522. There are two output ports on the 6522, port A and port B, each of which has eight pins, and we need 16 outputs, so we can just use all of them. In order to do that, I'm going to have to disconnect the LCD and other things that I've had connected to the 6522. If you've been following along with Benita's videos, then you should have the LCD hooked up to port B for its data lines and three control lines on port A. So in order to disable the LCD, all we need to do is disconnect the enable pin of the LCD from the 6522. And it's the one that goes into port A pin seven, it's the, high, the highest one from port A. And all I'm gonna do is connect that to round. Then we're gonna be able to use all the pins for whatever we want without upsetting the LCD. And I've done similar things for the other aspects of the circuit I have here, the buttons, the SD card reader, all of those things are disabled in exactly the same fashion as the LCD is there. So that means we're now free to use all the pins of the 6522 to drive our audio circuit. This is only temporary. I think it's important that we do make this work alongside the LCD and so on later on. But just for some initial tests, this is what I'm going to do. So let's make a little bit more space here and get to the tone generator circuit. I'm going to pop that in underneath. Let's chain the power down to it. I'm going to plug that into a speaker now and just make sure that still works. Sounds fine. I'm going to do this in two stages. First of all, I'm going to wire up the octave divider to port A on the 6522. And then I'm going to run a program with the 6502 driving just the octave divider. So in order to do that, let's pull out all of these green links from the octave divider. And just for convenience sake here, I'm going to use some of this rainbow ribbon cable to, to connect that up. I wouldn't recommend using this kind of thing permanently. These things make awful connections from, from my past experience, but um, it's, it'll be enough just for testing this and we'll replace it with a different setup fairly soon anyway. So yeah, don't worry too much about how tidy the wiring is on this. It's only temporary. So 
So those are now wired into port A. Uh, this is the low pin on port A at the left hand side. And the high pin is on the right hand side. Grey, white, black, brown are the low pin, are the low bits. And they go on the bottom row of the counter. Remember the counter's bottom bits are on the bottom row. Um, and they start with the low bit at this end and the high bit at that end. And then for the for the high four bits, they go onto the top row of the down, of the down counter. And the highest bit is actually on the left hand end. So these ones, the red, orange, yellow, and green, I'm going to just twist around so that the green is on the left hand side of the top row. So the bottom pin of port A is connected to the lowest pin on the on the down counter. And then as we move up through the pins on port A, we move along the bottom row of the down counter and then come back along the top row of the down counter, leaving off the two end pins because they're used for other things. It's all the same pins that we had the green wires on before. So I'm going to stop there, leave it just like that, and I am going to now show you the code that we're going to run on this, which is going to do some tricks with the octave number to, to make an interesting sound. So this is the program we're going to be using for cycling the octave frequency divider through various different values so that we can hear what that sounds like. So in terms of things that are different to the way Ben sets this up, uh, I, because, of, because we're using both all of port A and all of port B as outputs, um, we now need to set both of them to FF in order to, for all of their pins to be outputs. And I've also cleared the port A and port B output registers to zero here as well, just to give them a common starting point. This is the main. This is the start of the main loop. Um, we're starting with the frequency divider set to FF. That's all bits set, and that should give us the lowest tone we can make. And then we have this octave loop, where we store out that uh, value from the accumulator uh, to port A, which is the port that drives the octave frequency divider. Then we have a short delay just so that it doesn't suddenly zap through all of them really quickly. Um, and then what we do is we shift A to the right. This essentially divides it by two. It's not quite dividing by two, but because of the way the down counters are wired, the number, the number of cycles they count is actually one greater than the value we put in. So up here we're putting in 255. That means that the total count in the down counter is going to count from 255 down to zero and then start again, which is 256 cycles. When we shift FF to the right, we get 7F, uh, which is 127. And if you add one to that, you get 128, which is half of 256. So this shifting right does indeed halve the value. It doesn't, it doesn't halve the specific value in the accumulator, but it halves the value one greater than what's in the accumulator, essentially. And so long as we don't get to zero, we loop back to octave loop. When we get to zero, it means we've actually run out of bits and we can't go any, any higher than that. It'll, it'll be the maximum, the maximum octave we can get to at that stage. So we jump back to the main loop and start again with FF again. This is the delay subroutine. It's not very complicated. I mean, we're, we're saving all the registers first of all, load X and Y with zero, and then basically we just loop through Y until it gets back to zero again, and then we then we increase X and go back again if if that's not zero. Um, so you know, then 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 Y will loop from zero all the way around again one more time, and essentially this will the whole thing will loop around 256 times 256 cycles, um, with about I don't know 10 odd cycles per loop. Um, so it'll give a reasonable delay um, before returning. And that's basically it for the program. That's all there is to this one. Um, so let's let's go back to the breadboard and get this program done some NetProm and see what it sounds like. Okay, so that's all programmed up. So let's turn it on and see what it sounds like. So that's pretty much as I expected. You can hear the stepping up octave by octave. I think the lower frequencies there are pretty hard to make out. I don't know whether that's actually hitting the octaves properly. I think technically it probably is, but it's pretty hard to hear in your ears uh, down that end. But that's okay. We just won't use those low frequencies probably. 
and the high end is pretty good. I think we could we could go for higher frequencies if we wanted to, but I think this is enough to be able to play some interesting music. So now let's go ahead and do exactly the same thing, but for the sub-octave divider. Once again, I'm just going to pull out all the green wires. We don't need them anymore, those were only for hand coding it and testing. So we're going for blue, purple, grey, white. So these are the bottom four bits, so they go to the bottom row of the timer chip. These are the high bits of port B. That's going to be orange, yellow, blue, green in resistor colour code order. And remember these need to be flipped around when they're connected to the down counter. So the lowest left hand bit on the 6522 is going to go to the right hand bit on the down counter on the top row. So let's go and have another look at the code and put some code in which will drive this second down counter as well. So this is the same program that I've updated now to also uh, write some values out on port B. Um, it's much the same at the top, but when we get into the main loop here, uh, we, we store the octave, but then we start doing a loop over X as well, and X starts off at 255 here, dollar $FF, and X is actually tracking the sub-octave frequency division, as, as it says in the comments. So within the X loop, we store that out on port B, which will make the, make the note play at this frequency. Then we have our delay, and then we decrement X, um, and decrementing X will increase the frequency because it decreases the amount it's being divided by. Uh, we loop back around the X loop so long as this doesn't become positive. Top bit of X is set here, which means that as far as signed arithmetic is concerned, it's considered a negative number. We, back, we get back down here, we only branch if X is still negative. If X has gone positive, that is if it's reached 127, I want to jump to the next octave up and reset X back to 255 again. So the rest of this is basically the same as the end, tail end of the octave loop before. The only, thing, the only thing that's new here is this extra X loop inserted in the middle to write some values out on port B. Um, I also shortened the delay here because we're doing a lot more loops in the main loop now. It's, it's two nested loops up there, so uh, I've reduced the delay here quite significantly. That's now on E0. It was on 0, 0. Um, so this, this shortens the loop by a factor of about 8. Um, but yeah, the rest of that's all the same as before. Let's program this onto an EPROM and turn it on and see what happens. Great, so with that code in place, uh, the EPROM has now been reprogrammed. Let's have a look and see whether we get a nice continuous sweep of frequency. Sounds like it's working. <laughs> Pretty good. So that's, that's that's nice. You can hear the, the all the range of different frequencies that we can output from this, and that's all being driven from the 6502. So the next stage is going to be to work out exactly what numbers we want the 6502 to write onto these ports in order to get actual musical notes out. Obviously we've had octaves, we've had a, a, a continuous frequency sweep. Now we need to be able to pick the exact frequencies of the standard musical notes. Uh, and then we'll be able to play tunes. And that's what I'm going to be talking about in the next video. So please like and subscribe and activate notifications so that you, get, so that you know when that video comes along. And comment down below, especially if you're following along. If you've built anything like this, I'd love to hear from you. And if you have any questions, if anything was unclear, then do let me know and I'll, I'll do my best to help out. Also, check out some of my other videos. I'm going to put a link in the description below to one of the recent ones on multiplexing on the 6522 because that's a very relevant topic for what we're doing here and we are going to need to use that technique 
in a, in a couple of videos time in order to be able to have the audio output working alongside the LCD and buttons. So as always, good luck with your projects and I'll see you next time. Beep.